Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Edwin George, and the topic is multiple system atrophy differential diagnosis. Now, I understand we have a fairly general audience, so I'm going to start by talking about what we mean by differential diagnosis. You see here the uh, dictionary definition of differential diagnosis is the process of differentiating between two or more conditions which share similar signs or symptoms. What most of us think of when we hear differential diagnosis is the second definition, a list of possible conditions or diseases that could be causing the current symptoms. Uh, that's actually the first step. You can't start differentiating between two or more conditions with similar sim signs and symptoms until you have a list of possible uh, conditions that you want to consider. And I'm going to show you a number of lists, you know, not to go through them individually, but to point out just how many things uh, make it on the list of differential diagnosis. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we do some differentiation and end up with uh, uh, a hope for the future. So uh, multiple system atrophy is an adult onset progressive neurodegenerative disorder that manifests clinically with autonomic failure, Parkinsonism, and ataxia in any combination. And that's kind of the key here. So I have this Venn diagram you can see with Parkinsonism, cerebellar ataxia, and autonomic failure. And where they all overlap in the middle, you have this little red triangle. And you would think, okay, if you're in that red triangle, you must have multiple system atrophy, right? You've got all three in some combination. Uh, it turns out that we need specific parts of uh, particularly autonomic failure, but uh, it's also falls afoul of some other diagnostic principles. So here are two competing diagnostic principles. One is Occam's razor, which you may have run into in other contexts in terms of logical arguments, it says that the simplest explanation is usually the best. In clinical diagnosis, we phrase this as, no matter how you stretch and squeeze, give the patient one disease. Uh, this says that if you can come up with one diagnosis that explains all the different symptoms, then that's most likely what your patient has. However, against this, we have Hickam's dictum, uh, patients can have as many diseases as they darn well please. And it turns out that this is a significant issue, particularly when you start looking at probabilities. So here we're in the red triangle, and we have all three Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's symptoms. We have uh, some cerebellar dysfunction. We have autonomic failure. And at the top of the list, multiple system atrophy. However, multiple system atrophy is not all that common a disease. Parkinson's disease, regular Parkinson's disease, is actually far more common, and diabetes is extremely common, and diabetes often causes neuropathies, both sensory neuropathies and autonomic neuropathies. So it's possible to have both Parkinson's disease and diabetes and end up with some sensory ataxia and some autonomic failure. And in fact, I have many more patients in my practice who actually have both regular Parkinson's disease and diabetes with some of these symptoms than I do have patients who actually have multiple system atrophy. So the probability does not necessarily favor multiple system atrophy just because you have all of the types of signs and symptoms present. In addition, there's a number of other forms of Parkinson's um, besides multiple system atrophy and Parkinson's disease. They're not nearly as common, but you can still combine them with diabetes causing uh, autonomic neuropathy and maybe sensory ataxia. And then there are cerebellar diseases that can cause some Parkinsonism and combine them with common diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. So you can come up with a substantial list of things that you might have, even if you're in the red triangle in the middle of the uh, Venn diagram. 
However, here's a quote from uh, a paper. It says, multiple system atrophy may be difficult to distinguish clinically from other disorders, particularly in the early stages of disease, which is what we're most concerned with. Uh, autonomic only presentation can be indistinguishable from pure autonomic failure. Patients presenting with Parkinsonism may be misdiagnosed as having Parkinson's disease. Uh, patients presenting with cerebellar type of multiple system atrophy can mimic other adult onset ataxias. And there's a list of things that can cause adult onset ataxias here. So that's exactly what happens. And actually the most common thing is to present with autonomic failure. So <clears throat> we have the start in the autonomic failure circle and then arrows that patients will begin to move into the junctures as they develop some Parkinsonism or develop some ataxia. But if you're still in the purely blue-green circle of autonomic failure, here is the list of the differential diagnosis for the autonomic symptoms. Uh, at the top, you see a rather short list of about eight items, which are things that can cause autonomic neuropathy. And of course, diabetes heads the list, although I think it may be too small for you to see that. But then the rest of the slide after the second bold heading lists different symptoms that can be due to autonomic failure, but each of them has their own differential list of diseases that might cause those symptoms, even if you don't have autonomic failure. So when you put this whole list together, picking out the symptoms that a given patient might have who has purely autonomic problems, you get a fairly large list of possible diseases to work through and try and choose which one they might have. A lot of <clears throat> patients, particularly in North America, start out with Parkinsonism uh, <clears throat> and then move towards having autonomic failure. And Parkinsonism also has a fairly large list of potential diagnoses. Um, <clears throat> so here you see a list of the akinetic rigid syndrome. The akinetic rigid syndrome is another term for Parkinsonism type symptoms, specifically uh, without the uh, tremor. So in there's down in the bottom uh, right corner of the slide, there are juvenile onset diseases that we don't have to worry about with people who develop multiple system atrophy because they will tend to be adults by the time they develop symptoms of multiple system atrophy. But on this list, we have pure, for pure Parkinsonism, Parkinson's disease, which is in fact by far the most common of the items on this list. Uh, Post-encephalitic Parkinsonism used to be a lot more common, is fairly rare these days, uh, related to a specific uh, encephalitis that used to cause it. Uh, Drug-induced Parkinsonism is not all that rare, um, but usually fairly easy to pick out because you have to be on appropriate medication, although that still leaves you asking, okay, is it the medication or is it the underlying disease? And then you get what's often called Parkinsonism Plus, which includes, as you can see towards the bottom of the screen, multiple system atrophy, both MSA. P, of course, has Parkinsonism, but also patients with MSAC, primarily cerebellar form, usually have or develop some degree of Parkinsonism during the course of their disease. But there are several other diseases like progressive supranuclear palsy and cortical basilar degeneration that are Parkinsonian diseases, again, rare as is multiple system atrophy. And then there's fairly common, not as common as Alzheimer's disease, uh, diffuse Lewy body disease at the top right corner, also known as dementia with Lewy bodies. And this can present with Parkinsonism before you have any dementia, and, uh, but has Parkinson's signs as fairly prominent features of the disease. Um, many other dementias like Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementias, 
et cetera, can cause some Parkinsonism more often late in the disease, but uh, they're in the differential. And of course, cerebrovascular disease can cause both dementia, but also can cause vasculogenic Parkinsonism. You can get Parkinsonism after a traumatic brain injury or after anoxia with hydrocephalus. And in fact, with normal pressure hydrocephalus, she doesn't usually look quite typically Parkinsonian, but nonetheless finds its way into the differential. So you have this large list of things when somebody presents with some initial akinetic rigid type Parkinsonian symptoms, again, that you need to work through. And as I mentioned earlier, Parkinson's disease is by far the most common of these. And that brings us to another diagnostic principle known as Sutton's Law, which again, you may have run into in other places besides medicine. Uh, Willie Sutton was a bank robber, relatively successful. He uh, stole over $2 million from banks over the course of his career. And he reputedly replied to a reporter's in inquiry as to why he robbed banks by saying, because that's where the money is. Actually, Sutton himself in a memoir uh, said that he never actually said that, but the quote became quite famous. And it's often used to argue the point, you know, there's a lot of money in banks. Well, there's a lot of people with Parkinson's disease among the people who have Parkinsonian symptoms. So you go where there's the most of what you're looking for. So most people who present with Parkinson's symptoms unless they have something else to suggest a different diagnosis, which we're always looking for, um, are going to be labeled initially as actually having Parkinson's disease, because the odds are that that's what they've got. Now, I wanted to mention in here with some of those uh, other Parkinsonian syndromes. So here's PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy. And you see the red typical, and in the puzzle piece, uh, labeled the PSPS. The first item is vertical supranuclear gaze palsy from which the disease gets its name. The problem with this is patients typically present with Parkinsonian signs and symptoms and may not develop the vertical gaze palsy for several years uh, at the beginning of the disease. But they do have falls and they have relative lack of response to treatment with levodopa which are also things that come up frequently in diseases like multiple system atrophy. And if you look over at some of the atypical blue puzzle pieces, there's one called PSPC that even produces cerebellar ataxia. So with the appropriate presentation, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy can look very much like it might be actually multiple system atrophy. And finally, of course, you can begin life with the cerebellar ataxia uh, <clears throat> and then move into having autonomic failure and maybe eventually Parkinsonism. So this brings up another list of potential uh, diagnoses, some of which we saw in that earlier slide, which started listing all the different uh, adult onset uh, ataxias. And some are often pretty easy to exclude. And if you've never had chemotherapy for cancer, you probably don't have ataxia from their chemotherapeutic agents if you've never been on lithium. Sometimes exposure to lead or exposure to toluene is not as obvious as you might think um, and so forth. But then when you get to the bottom of the list, paraneoplastic or autoimmune disease, these are patients who make antibodies that affect their cerebellar function. They may do it as a purely autoimmune disease, uh, which can spontaneously arise or actually probably triggered by exposure to some infection or something in the environment that induces their body to make these antibodies. Or it can be perineoplastic, where they're actually making antibodies to fight off a tumor which they may or may not know they have, but the antibodies themselves start to cause problems with cerebellar function 
and produce cerebellar ataxia. And there are a number of different antibodies that can do this. And then there are genetic ataxias. So here's a big list. And again, you can't read it, uh, though you might make out at the bottom, we get all the way up to spinocerebellar ataxia number 35. So it's a lengthy list of different genetic spinocerebellar ataxias. Now, when running up against a new case of one of these, most of these start, and you probably can't read the center column of age of onset, but there are a lot of them that say that they start in infancy or in childhood or uh, <clears throat> in uh, early adulthood. And of course, being genetic, these are all, all uh, autosomal dominant diseases, which means the disease appears in every sequential generation. So you usually have a fi family history. Um, the problem with taking that approach is uh, that quite a few of these are CAG repeat expansion diseases. You'll see that certainly the top uh, five say that. And these are diseases that show anticipation. So these repeats that we talk about are often present in the normal gene and don't cause any problems. But you, if you accidentally get a few too many repeats in your gene, then it becomes unstable and subsequent generations keep getting a few more repeats. And eventually you get enough repeats that it causes disease. So when there's a family that has one of these diseases, there's a progenitor, the first person in the family who manages to accumulate enough repeats to have any signs and symptoms of disease. The number of repeats you have generally has a correlation with age of onset and uh, how severe the symptoms are. So there's always the possibility with these diseases that you may be the progenitor of a new family kindred. So you have no family history and you have an older onset. And again, you probably have trouble making it out, but almost all of these in the center column where they talk about where they can present start, may start with early adulthood or childhood or infancy, but then says to adulthood or to advanced adulthood and so forth. So that uh, that includes uh, the possible presentation that would be in an age where you might start wondering about MSAC. Also note in the uh, little red circles, a number of these diseases among their common symptoms include Parkinsonism. So this also can be a confounding factor. I should mention that many of the paraneoplastic or autoimmune diseases that I mentioned on the last slide also can cause Parkinsonism as one of their symptoms. So this slide is still labeled genetic cerebellar ataxias, but actually the top half of the slide, uh, you'll see a whole bunch of the spinocerebellar ataxias listed there. And these are ones whose combinations of symptoms and average age of onset uh, in decade, which is given uh, again in a sort of center column there, um, <clears throat> allows them to be considered multiple system atrophy mimic genetic syndromes. Uh, so there's quite a few of those. And in addition to uh, many of the spinocerebellar ataxias, there are other forms of ataxias, including uh, the uh, recessive ataxia, uh, which is Friedrich's ataxia. And uh, then in the bottom half of the slide are other genetic diseases, genetic forms of Parkinsonism, uh, genetic diseases that cause spastic gates, that cause autonomic failure, and more complex phenotypes. So everything on this slide is not cerebellar disease, but everything on this slide is a genetic disease that can be mistaken for multiple system atrophy or uh, is a multiple system atrophy mimic, as it says at the top of the slide. <clears throat>
uh, I wanted to point out here. So for instance, uh, the third one down is spinal cerebellar atrophy. Number three, we talked about probabilities before. The probability of getting a spinal cerebellar atrophy of a particular type varies considerably around the world as shown by all these pie charts. So you see over on the left, SCA3, if you have a spinal cerebellar ataxia in Brazil, it's by far the most likely that you're going to have SCA3, which is a multiple system atrophy mimic. And some of the other parts of the world, there's much less SCA3, but there are still other SCAs that are considered multiple system atrophy uh, mimics. So you not only have to worry about whether you've got one, but what you're likely to have according to where you're located. In addition, I mentioned Friedrich's ataxia. This is the most common uh, hereditary ataxia in the Western world. Uh, counts for three quarters of the ataxias presenting under 25 years of age, at which age you would not generally consider multiple system atrophy to be a possibility, but it has a lot of uh, variants. And towards the bottom of the page, you'll see variants, LOFA, late onset Friedrich's ataxia. So occasionally you get a patient who has actually Friedrich's ataxia presenting at an older age group that might be consistent with multiple system atrophy. And because this is a recessive disease, not a dominant disease, it doesn't appear in every generation. And so while there may in fact be a family history, uh, many people don't know what uh, diseases their great grandparents and so forth had. So there's not generally a clear family history that you can obtain. It appears to be a spontaneous uh, cerebellar ataxia uh, and it can be presenting in a somewhat older patient than usual in order to be confounded with early presentation of multiple system atrophy. So <clears throat> here we have really at least three big lists of different diseases that you might have when you first present with multiple system atrophy. And as the original dictionary definition said, the process of differential diagnosis is trying to sort out um, <clears throat> which of these items on the list you might actually have. And so we have diagnostic criteria, which some of the other speakers will, I believe, be speaking about. The first diagnostic criteria for multiple system atrophy were proposed in 1989. Then consensus criteria were published in 1998, further revised in 2008. Uh, there's a committee that's been working on uh, updated uh, consensus criteria that were expected to come out uh, a year or two ago, but COVID has really slowed that process down. As of my recording this, I don't think they've announced new consensus criteria but we think it's just around the corner. Um, but the existing criteria say to have definite multiple system atrophy requires pathologic examination of brain tissue. This happens post-mortem, which is to say we can never be absolutely sure that what patients have is multiple system atrophy unless we have an autopsy. And this is, uh, <clears throat> I thought about subtitling this talk why is it that my clinician can't say that I definitely have multiple system atrophy or that other clinicians question the diagnosis all the time? We're always looking for new signs and symptoms to show, show up and maybe push the differential diagnosis in a different direction. So clinically, the best you can do is probably multiple system atrophy. And according to the criteria, it has to have an onset of more than 30 years of age, a specific degree of autonomic dysfunction uh, with some Parkinsonism or cerebellar ataxia. And if there's Parkinsonism, Parkinsonism also poor levodopa response to the Parkinsonism. So unless you have all of these things, including specific uh, 
types of autonomic dysfunction, we can't say that you have probable multiple system atrophy according to the criteria. Now, there is a category of possible multiple system atrophy. It still needs an onset of more than 30 years of age, a lesser degree of autonomic dysfunction with Parkinsonism or cerebellar ataxia, plus one of 13 additional features, uh, one of which, of course, is if you have Parkinsonism, uh, less uh, levodopa response than in typical Parkinson's disease. Uh, so if you just don't have quite the degree of autonomic dysfunction, uh, you could end up being possible MSA and very close to being probable. Um, the additional features, there are 13 of them, but most of them, all except two, are either specific to having some Parkinsonism or having some cere cerebellar dysfunction. Um, and the additional features, which I won't go through, but they involve certain clinical signs and symptoms and the timing of the onset of the signs and symptoms versus uh, when the presentation first occurred and some radiologic test findings, both on multiple magnetic resonance imaging and a couple of types of nuclear medicine scans. Now in the discussion of further revising the criteria, numbers of things have been suggested as things that might be added to change the criteria and help us to wean through our uh, lists of differential diagnostic possibilities. There's some things that come up with numeric scoring schemes. So there's one scheme that says and give one point each for orthostatic hypotension, urinary retention, symptoms of overactive bladder, and postural instability. And says that if you have two or more points in early Parkinson's presentation, it suggests that it might be MSA. So this could be another criteria. Um, there are additional test findings on radiology studies and some laboratory tests, certain um, levels of circulating proteins that are uh, common in the nervous system that, again, can be suggestive that you might have multiple system atrophy. It's also been suggested that there should be more subtypes. Some people who at autopsy clearly do have multiple system atrophy actually had a younger onset than 30 years of age. Some had a old, very old onset that's usually considered less likely to be multiple system atrophy. Some had very long duration of disease, um, which is, gets into the timing uh, uh, features of the existing uh, criteria. And you know, should there be a subset that's totally mixed Parkinsonian, cerebellar, et cetera. In addition, and these are uh, what we often refer to as red flags, suggesting someone with multiple, we think might have multiple system atrophy probably doesn't. So there's a series at the top that if these symptoms show up, uh, it's more likely Parkinson's disease than multiple system atrophy, or the next group is things that suggest it's more likely that it's diffuse Lewy body disease or dementia with Lewy bodies if you have these symptoms appearing uh, than truly being multiple system atrophy, and so on, MSA versus PSP, MSA versus CBS, et cetera. So these red flags could be added to the criteria as exclusionary criteria. So I wanted to leave you with the last bit of uh, hope, moving towards a non-clinical diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> the uh, definite MSA requires the pathology in the brain, but we now understand that this pathology arises from aggregation of misfolded proteins. At the uh, top here, you see this little stringy thing that's supposed to be an unfolded alpha-synuclein uh, protein chain, and then it can fold up into various shapes, not generally such uh, nice geometric shapes, but for the purposes of illustration. Um, and uh, 
one of these shapes would be uh, the one that doesn't form ag one of the ones that doesn't form aggregates and does perform the normal function of the protein. But it can fold into at least two different shapes that you see going down the slide begin to clump together and form aggregates. And in fact, it's thought that these shapes can act as scaffolding to induce more protein to misfold in the same way. And that this is how we get the spreading of protein aggregates through the brain and causing the pathology of disease. <clears throat> so in the last couple of years, there have been experiments in the lab described. On the left side of this slide, you see they've taken spinal fluid from patients, healthy controls, patients thought to have multiple system atrophy, patients thought to have Parkinson's disease, and used the protein in the spinal fluid as a seed to induce additional protein to create aggregates in a flask or a tube. And then they've used some uh, fluorescent marker, which binds more strongly to uh, certain uh, aggregates than others. And that you can see that they can largely separate out what are probably aggregates formed from spinal fluid from multiple system atrophy versus a different aggregate formed from Parkinson's disease patients. And the healthy controls <clears throat> don't produce aggregates that show up with fluorescence. Moreover, the kinetics, the rate at which these things aggregate in the experiment is very different, which can be used to differentiate them. And then there are other things. Once you've produced an aggregate seated by a patient's spinal fluid to distinguish um, which kind of aggregates you've got. And this is another one looking at, again, alpha-synuclein aggregation in vitro. But uh, here they're comparing Parkinson's patients versus dementia with Lewy body patients. And they know because you see what they're seeding with is actually a homogenate of brain tissue frontal cortex at the top, substantia nigra compact at the bottom. But again, they can show in vitro that they can determine what kind of aggregation they've seeded with the sample from the patient. And now some of the other diseases that we mentioned as mimics include things like PSP, uh, which you'll see on this slide. These experiments were to determine these are diseases that don't involve alpha-synuclein aggregation, but involve aggregation of a different protein, the tau protein, which aggregates in uh, Alzheimer's disease. So on the left side, the uh, bright orange dots separated uh, from the various other diseases listed down the slide uh, are aggregates that suggest Alzheimer's disease. And on the right side, they're looking at a different kind of dementia called Pick's disease. So the idea is that with the appropriate conditions and substrates, you might be able to take spinal fluid from patients and figure out what kind of aggregation they're inclined to do. So I'm hopeful, and they've filed a whole bunch of patents on these techniques, but uh, there's nothing out there yet to that we can actually use. But I'm hopeful that in future years, if you fall anywhere on this Venn diagram, we'll collect some spinal fluid and send it off for a panel of aggregation studies and say, well, you may only have autonomic failure or only Parkinsonism, but you look like you've got the kind of protein aggregation that produces the pathology of multiple system atrophy or the pathology of progressive supranuclear palsy, or the pathology of regular Parkinson's. And then we won't have to rely on the timing and appearance of different symptoms to work our way through the differential diagnosis. So I want to leave you with that hopeful note, which again, this is the basic science still and not practically available, but it seems to have great potential. And thank you for your attention.